Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's four o'clock now, so we'll get started. Uh, thank you all for booking on to this webinar today, uh, the Charles Booth Archive and Booth Online. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Indy and Neil, who work at LSE Library, about uh, the history of Charles Booth and their work at the library on the Charles Booth Archive, and also a bit about how you can help us um, transform uh, the map into a um, more technological resource. Uh, but Neil will get to that in more detail later. I uh, just introduce myself. I'm Liam Cunningham. I work as volunteer coordinator with Layers of London. Um, we've been running these webinars for the past few weeks now, uh, and they've been going for a while, so I think today is going to be good too. Uh, just to let you know a bit about the structure, I'm going to pass over to Indy in a bit, who will uh, start with the substance of the webinar, but just to say you won't be able to use your cameras or microphones. Um, they will do their presentation, and then, then at the end we'll have time for questions and answers, uh, which you can then put in the chat box. Um, just stop sharing this. And you can open the chat box by button in the black main menu at the bottom of the screen. Um, so please save your questions until then, unless it's particularly urgent. Um, so I think that's everything. Uh, I'll pass over to you, Indy, now. Great. Thanks, Liam. Uh, and hello, everyone. Welcome to the talk today. Uh, so my name's Indy Buller, and I'm just going to hopefully this will work. Share my screen. The dreaded moment where you share your screen and you don't know what's going to happen. There we go. Hopefully that's a presentation slide that you can all see. Um, as I said then, my name is Indy Buller uh, and uh, myself and Neil Stewart uh, are from the LSE and we're going to be talking to you today about the Charles Booth archive and Booth Online as well. Uh, so without further ado, let's move on to this lovely picture here of, uh, of Charles Booth. Um, looking ever the proto hipster kind of thing, as he was, uh, well, wasn't really. Um, this photo would have been from the later part of his, of his life. He was actually born in Liverpool uh, in 1840, uh, born and raised in Liverpool. Um, and he lived there for, for many years. He uh, was born to a kind of relatively wealthy family in Liverpool. They were, generally speaking, quite liberal in their politics. Uh, Booth himself was fairly liberal. He kind of veered between laissez-faire and, and liberal, economic liberalism, I suppose you say, and uh, social liberalism. He himself, I think, I believe I'm right in saying, campaigned for a liberal politician to become MP uh, in Liverpool in the 1865 election, but they failed. They didn't actually get through. Um, as I mentioned, they were a fairly wealthy family that Booth uh, came from. Uh, but Booth's main source of income, he created himself, really, with the help of his brother. Um, both of them founded a shipping company called the uh, Alfred Booth Shipping Company, which I think was still in operation until the early 80s, early 1980s. Um, and it was a very successful operation. Uh, it it uh, traded all over the world in kind of goods and services. I think they did... Uh, some element of uh, tourism as well as part of their company. And what's kind of most rem remarkable for me, I think, about this, some of this, well, one of the most remarkable things about this story is that Booth was co-chairing, uh, uh, well, she was chairing the shipping company whilst he was also splitting time and carrying out this enormous social survey of London, which is pretty extraordinary <laughs> um, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so, that's how he made a lot of money. A lot of the money that went into the uh, survey that he's famous for uh, came out of his, his business interests. So it was self-funded. He was, as it says there, also interested in statistics and maths. Uh, and in around the 1870s, he got married to a woman called uh, Mary Macaulay and they, well, Mary Booth, as she kind of took his name. They both then moved down to London, which is sort of where we start the story of the uh, Booth's famous survey of London. Booth and, um, well, Charles and Mary were both kind of, as I mentioned there before, well connected. They were in kind of fairly intellectual social circles. Some of their friends um, were interested in the issue of poverty. Uh, and I believe among them there was people like Octavia Hill, who of course established the philanthropic housing, social, early kind of social housing. 
uh, was counted as one of their friends, and Canon Samuel Barnett, who of course founded the East End Settlement, Toynbee Hall, which is still um, doing great things today. Um, indeed, some of Booth's researchers and his assistants came from their uh, spent time at Toynbee Hall. Um, so they kind of knew people who were interested in the issue of poverty. Um, and you have to remember that London at the time um, was, of course, the largest city in the world, probably the wealthiest city in the world, if that could be measured, certainly part in the heart of the wealthiest empire. And that was all true, but there was also a, an enormous amount of poverty. And one of the press clippings that I've got on this slide that you can see on the left hand side is from the Manchester Guardian. Uh, and it's essentially telling the story of a demonstration in which happened in February 1886. And it started out as a fairly peaceful demonstration. It was meant to be a, a demonstration by the uh, unemployed, by the, and it was established or set up, organized by an organization called the Social, Social Democratic Federation, which was a, a Marxist organization, one of the first, I believe, in, in England. And it turned violent. It later turned violent. People then ended up going on a bit of a rampage and smashing up uh, shop windows in, in the West End. And this is February 1886 that this happens. Booth's first meeting to discuss his survey uh, is just a couple of months later in April 1886. So there's this quite febrile atmosphere happening at, at, at the time. There'd be other demonstrations as well beforehand. Um, and it's generally considered that many countries indeed were, part, were in, in the midst of a long depression at this point in time. So there's a lot of poverty. There's a great deal of interest about it. The man that you can see at the bottom of the headline there, interview with Mr. Heinemann, Henry Heinemann, is kind of fairly well um, connected to the mythos, really, of Booth and the Booth survey. He, as I mentioned, was a member of the Social Democratic Federation. And it's said that he carried out a, well, his organization carried out a, a survey into London poverty. And they came away and discovered that 25% of London Londoners uh, were living in poverty. And as the story goes, that Booth heard this number, this figure of 25%, and he poo pooed it and he said, This is ridiculous. I'm going to start a survey that disproves this and that this shows that this is wrong. And of course, what happens? He finds that it's 30% of Londoners who are living in poverty, 30.7 to be exact. And of course, that's the famous story of how it started. I'm not sure how true that is. I, I know that Booth knew Heinemann and they had. Uh, they, they did meet, but whether it was this kind of fractious relationship and whether Booth was so annoyed and angered by this, this uh, statistic, I don't know. I've, I've got a feeling it's a little bit um, uh, of a long shot. Um, and I, I say that because it's quite important to understand the motivations and the reasons, I think, for Booth starting his survey because it kind of lays out the foundation for it being this key piece of social science research right, to the method is, is quite important. And I th think there's something also to be said for the, for the reason why that the survey started. And there's this lovely little quote that you can see here, again, hopefully, um, from a book by Rosemary O'Day and David Englander, which is fantastic, by the way, it's absolutely brilliant. And it, it's called Mr. Charles Booth's Inquiry. And it goes into all this detail about the uh, in inquiry itself, but also the archives. It's really fantastic um, text. And uh, the quote here is from them. There seems to be little doubt that he consciously compared the task he saw before him with that of the Department of State collecting the information it required before evolving appropriate policies, right? So before he came up with these kind of ideas and theses, he wanted to gather data. And he did indeed gather a lot of it. And again, we'll go into some of this a little bit more. I'm doing some shameless LSE plugging, as you can see on the slide as well, uh, with the LSE badge and motto, rerum cognoscere causas. That's how you say it. And that means to know the causes of things. So that's that's quite that links very neatly with Charles Booth and Booth's survey. Of course, LSE is founded years after Booth starts his survey, but I think it's quite a nice link because Booth wanted to understand why, to know the causes of things is, is why you want to, is why there's an LSE. Uh, there's another LSE connection in that Beatrice Webb, one of the co-founders of LSE, was actually a very early Booth assistant. She was herself uh, at the time, Beatrice Potter, 
and was Mary Macaulay's first cousin. Uh, and she knew Booth and knew the family very well. And Booth got her to do a survey of the East End uh, dock work. And so that appears in the first volume of Booth's text as well. So there's another connection there. And then finally, um, the follow-up survey to Booth is uh, one which was established and run from uh, LSE. It's called the New Survey of London, and that was carried out in the 1920s and 30s and led by Hubert Llewellyn Smith. So the inquiry itself is split into, well, a series, a set of series, really. Uh, the famous series, of course, is the poverty series, which includes the famous maps. But Booth realizes quite quickly that you can't really understand poverty just by looking at it in isolation. He realizes that poverty is connected to industry, to the type of work available to people. And so he wanted to try and understand what industry, the situation was in terms of industry and employment in London. He also then goes on to realize that Religion plays some part, particularly in a kind of sense of the um, charitable work that was going on at the time. And then he also wanted to understand the social aspect of life and the people living in London as well. So he speaks to charitable workers, he speaks to priests, to parishioners. He then also speaks to all sorts of different people employed in, in different areas of uh, the arts and entertainment too. So how do they go about doing it? Well, I kind of broached on some of that just then. Uh, there's four and a half million people living in London when they started the survey. I'm sure that went up by the time it finished in 1903. Um, so that's a lot of people. So I, the common kind of thinking is that it started off being a house to house survey, particularly for the poverty survey, but it didn't because they'd still be doing it today if that, if that had been the case. These were the days before Excel, remember. So instead what they did, um, Abuz and his researchers did, throughout was to do some degree of first person, a, gr a great degree of first person research, but they also contact experts. And for the poverty survey, they speak to school board visitors, essentially truancy officers. I suppose you could, might be able to think of them in that, in that way. School board visitors are created by a piece of legislation called the 1870 Elementary Education Act, which gives the right to children uh, from the ages of, I think, five to 13, the right to free access to education and if you don't go then you're fined and how do they how does this kind of structure exist to find parents well you have to have school board visitors who keep log books of children but also their families and what their families do and uh, whether they have siblings and all this kind of information so school board visitors is who Booth interviews to create his poverty notebooks and I'll just go back underneath that label there poverty series you can see a section of one of the original poverty notebooks and at the top, you can see the number, so the household number, the rooms they occupy, the class, which is actually what gives the, the colors on the maps. A and B were the worst kind of classes, the black and the dark blues, C, D were kind of light blues and moving on and up through the color scale. The occupation, laborer, pickler, wife, whether there was a wife, whether she worked, children, other children, what they earned, what the families earned, what they paid in rent. All this kind of data was gathered by school board visitors. So Booth sent his researchers to interview them uh, and to gather this information. He also interviewed religious figures, priests, people involved in charitable work, employers, trade unionists, staff, various other people. So a lot of first person observations and interviews, but also a lot of gathering of data, census data, annual reports, information that they create themselves and that all goes into 450 notebooks which we still have at LSE today, very proud to have, uh, which make up the backbone of, of Booth's research. That then gets converted into and written up into these 17 volumes starting off in 1889 uh, and then moving all the way through to 1903 when the very last volume is, is published. Again just a bit on the method here, so Booth, in terms of his social science credibility, is, is, has a lot because he realizes that mixed methodology for something um, like this is, is absolutely crucial. Um, by this, he wanted to gather both statistics and uh, qual qualitative data, so interviews and, and, and speaking to people, observation. Uh, and he wanted to use these methods together. And there's a little letter that he's written here to Beatrice Potter in 1886. And at the top, it says there, as to the methods of inquiry, I think I should say that the statistical method was needed to give bearings to the results of personal observation or personal observation to give life 
to statistics, which is kind of a lovely quote there. And then, of course, there's the maps, the famous, the most famous output, really, of all, all of this work, all of the 450 notebooks, all of the 17 volumes of hundreds of pages of text and tables pale, really, <laughs> when they're confronted by these wonderful maps. Uh, and you can see a kind of snippet of one here uh, from central London. The maps themselves were created right at the very start uh, of, of his survey. He's creating, he creates a one sheet of uh, poverty in East London. And then in 1889, this gets, uh, sorry, I think in 1891, this gets expanded to a four sheet map of, of a much larger part of London, more central London, really, as we know it today. And then 10 years later, Booth, uh, and that information is gathered from the um, school board visitors uh, data. 10 years later, Booth then realizes that he wants to go back and see how much of the colorings are still accurate, how much of these um, descriptions of these streets that they're given on, on my maps are still relevant. Are, are these still dark blue streets? Do these become red or pink? So rather than bothering the school board visitors again, what they do instead is send out um, one or two, not a huge amount of people, mo many of them done by one chap uh, called George Duckworth, uh, to go and accompany police officers on their beats around London. So the police officer would go out of an evening accompanied by George Duckworth, who takes along a notebook. And in the notebook, he writes what he finds about each individual street in London, uh, about the character of the street, the hat, this kind of height of the buildings, these kind of vague descriptions uh, sometimes of, of, uh, of the streets and sometimes they're incredibly detailed and, and very, uh, very much in depth. And so that's how they create the second edition maps. So they, George Duckworth goes along and says, well, this street used to be red. Is it still red today? Yes, we can generally say that the street hasn't improved much or hasn't changed much. Um, it's remained the same. And they do that for each street in London. Uh, God only knows who's paying for his shoes. But they get all of this information and the data and they then translate it into uh, the second edition maps, which we again have the working editions of the maps at LSE um, uh, in, in the school. Of course, alongside it, there's the famous um, classifications, uh, which go from yellow uh, at the top to black, uh, lowest class, vicious, semi-criminal is of course the famous uh, descriptor for that one that they're filled with this kind of uh, language. Uh, and then just quickly, because my time is running out, um, just quickly I wanted to talk a little bit about the relevance uh, of Booth's study. So it's it's something that's quite interesting. In 2016 we had an exhibition about Charles Booth marking the century in the eve of his death and I remember being on Twitter at the time and reading a report or seeing a report that was published uh, by the Joseph Roundry Foundation where they uh, discovered that essentially 55% of people within the kind of survey, 55% of people in UK poverty were in working families. So they were kind of still working. I remember that number rang a bell. So I went back to the first volume, the first volume of Booth's research. And inside it, there's a small sample that Booth did in 1886, where he tries to understand a little bit more, in a little bit more detail about why there's great poverty in this uh, sample essentially ascribes it to three things, questions of habit, questions of circumstance, questions of employment, and what is the highest reason for this uh, great poverty? In 55% of cases, it's questions of employment, which is exactly the same as it was uh, found, as was found by the Joseph Landry Foundation. So that is, um, yeah, which was quite shocking, uh, I found, but, uh, there is continued relevance and continued needs to carry out research and surveys like this, and people indeed still do today. So that's it from me. Um, I hope I haven't gone too over, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So Neil can show you uh, what we're doing today and how you might be able to help us. Thank you. Thanks, Indy. I think you were, you were bang on time there, so well done. Um, this is a bit of a new experience for us. So I'm going to try and do my screen sharing as well. So just bear with me a sec.
So my name's Neil Stewart. I'm Digital Library Manager at LSE Library. And let's see what happens when I do this. How's that looking? You can see Charles B's London now, hopefully. So uh, following on from Indy's overview of Booz and his work, I wanted to show you just a couple of websites which we've um, dedicated to making Booth's work hopefully accessible to modern day audiences. Um, don't worry too much about URLs, um, links to resources, because I'll share some of those at the end of the presentation. Um, and this, this stuff is readily Googleable, um, and other search engines are available too. Uh, so the first of the websites I wanted to talk about um, is Charles Booth's London, which we redeveloped in late 2016. Um, it's designed to give access primarily to, to the two most famous outputs of uh, Booth's survey, which, which Indy's giving you some background on, the poverty maps and the police notebooks. So here's the homepage of Charles Booth's London, and there is, um, uh, there is Charles himself with his uh, hipster beard that Indy mentioned earlier. Um, what we sh I think we should best do is dive straight into the maps, or the map in this case. What we've got on the Booth website is um, a single stitched map of all 12 of Booth's poverty maps of London. So they've been stitched together and they've been georectified, which means we've pinned them accurately to a modern day map of London. You can see the famous legends here, so the lowest class vicious semi-criminal. Um, Indy didn't mention this and it's some, an interesting thing about the word vicious here. Vicious is meant in the Victorian sense of being vice prone as opposed to, you know, vicious in the sense of um, would, would be nasty in a boxing ring kind of thing. Um, there's also, if we zoom in a little bit, we've got a zoom function so you can zoom in and out. It just takes a little while to resolve on my computer. We're going to hover over the area of, of um, uh, Hoban, which is where in modern day, the LSE is found, um, where Indy and I work. I'm gonna use the opacity slider to transfer across to modern day London. And you can see there, I'm just gonna hover, hover over under normal circumstances. That's where Indy and I would work, the British Library of Political and Economic Science, which is part of LSE. Um, we'll go back, as it were, we'll, we'll switch back into Victorian London. And you can you can run searches on the map as well. So I'm going to search for Southwold Road. There it is. The reason I chose Southwold Road is that is where I was born. Um, so I lived there until I was about two years old. Southwold Road at the time, you can see um, fairly comfortable, good ordinary earnings, which is probably still the case now, although obviously Hackney's been quite gentrified since. Um, so if we go back over to LSC, so if I can do this quickly, if I remember my way around. Uh, note there, that that's the city of London um, in the middle there, which barely anyone lived in, in, in 19th century London, so, so Booth's team didn't bother to, to classify that area. And we're back to LSE. And I wanted to show you that what we call in web development circles, some interaction designs. So we wanted, to, as well as to show off the maps, we wanted to make the notebooks available, um, the, the poverty notebooks, uh, so the, the police, sorry, the police notebooks. And what I'm gonna to do to make that occur is hit the show notebooks box. If we click through here, we can view a page. So we've got three notebook entries in that area and we'll have a look at the first one. And this takes you through to the notebooks. So from the map, you can get to the notebooks, which we thought was a really important thing um, to, to, uh, to allow people to do. And if we, if we go full screen here, you can see on the right, uh, this is one of Duckworth's, George Duckworth's notebooks, and he says we, we do a walk with Police Constable E. Tate around district bounded on the north by New Oxford Street in High Hoban, 
on the south by the city it continues and you can see a map he sketched of the area there and anyone who knows that bit of London will know that that's a fairly accurate representation of um, of that part of London so I'm going to go out of here and we also wanted to make the link from the notebooks to the map so you can you can search the notebooks and if we do a search here for high oops Hoban. third one down there you can say I want to view that on the map and that will take you back there and if we show the notebooks again it, it will show you notebooks in the vicinity of, of High Hoban. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention as well we, we what we try to do is give people an in to this archive which hopefully do with we do with the uh, with the website itself, but I should always also highlight, uh, as it were, highlight this highlights page, which are some essays written by our very own Indy, who spoke earlier, on some aspects of Victorian London, which we thought would would draw people into the archive. Maybe slightly salacious, but we we also we we hope also interesting in a way to um, to for people to to get a sense of what. Kind of richness that the archive contains and what you can find within it so do have a look at those if, if you're so inclined um, okay i would say the best way to understand this site is to, is to have a look at yourself and um, hopefully you'll get a good idea of, of what we've what we've tried to do and also the, the the richness of both the maps and the, and the notebooks so yeah that was the goal now the since launch of this site back in 2016 we've tried we've been trying to address a couple of issues and thinking how to address those issues so there, there are two of those we, we don't have a full data set of the victorian map on which booth's poverty maps were based so the names and the layouts of the streets themselves and we, we did a bit of work on this and we discovered that around 50 by estimate around 50 percent of london's streets have in one way or another changed since Booth, since late, uh, the late 19th century. So be that uh, the, the names of streets have changed, the layouts have changed. Um, obviously there have been events like slum clearances and the Blitz, which have, have had an effect on the uh, material, uh, material layout of, of London. And that applies to around 50% of streets, we think. Um, and no one as well has, has to our knowledge, has done work to uh, actually record the uh, the coloration of poverty that Booth and his team did on the maps. Um, so on that first issue, the, the, the Victorian uh, street map, we think there is a project going on at the moment that should take care of that to digitize 19th century ordnance survey maps and make them available in what we call machine readable format. So that, that's good. Um, the other thing we wanted to do, the, the um, create a data set of the poverty levels. Um, we thought hard about how we would do this and we thought it would take us at the library over a thousand hours to do ourselves, which um, wasn't really feasible. Um, so we thought that citizen, uh, citizen science would be a way to do this and the Layers of London project came along at a very good time for this. Um, we work with them to create a way for people who are interested in Booth, interested in London, interested in social history, uh, to create uh, a way for them to record poverty levels on the Booth maps. And this is what we came up with. And again, I'll share this URL at the end of the presentation. We tried to make this site straightforward to use. I'll give a very brief demonstration now. Um, so let's go in. It prompts you to choose a square, and I'm going to try this one. It zooms you in in quite nifty fashion. Okay, so what we're seeing here is it looks like it's already, this one's already been done. So people have drawn polygons around the poverty classifications. So I'm going to go back to the map. I'm going to try another one. How's your luck? Let's give this one a go. Yeah, this one looks looks better. So I'll zoom out a little bit. Now what's going on here 
it says this square needs tracing. So what we've got to do is we'll hit begin. What we've got to do is essentially draw polygons to record areas that Booth's team themselves recorded in the late 19th century. We had some, um, we, we weren't quite sure about this, like should we use Booth's, what, how Booth classified things or should we just try and record colours and we thought colours were best. So that one's done. I'll leave this um, open because um, I'll come back to this and finish off this square at a later, later time. So that's, that's essentially it. You, you record polygons and um, the second aspect of this work is to get other people to check. So where a square has been um, recorded, let's go to the southeast, it turns to yellow on the map and we ask other people to verify, verify one's work. Um, so let's have a look. And I think this is down in Blackheath. I think this looks pretty good. The polygons that have been recorded here um, look appropriate. So I'm going to say looks good. And we're done. So I verified that. And I'm going to go back. And remember where we are. I think it was about there, wasn't it? So let's zoom in a little bit more. And I'm going to refresh this and what you should see happening is one of those yellow squares I think here turned from yellow to uh, yellow to green. Live demo, let's see if that works. Yeah I think that worked, I think that was it, no it's that one. It used to be yeah. yellow, now it's green, mean that, meaning that it's been, someone has recorded the polygons and I've gone in and checked that looks right. And so everything's, everything's great on that particular square. So as you can see, I, I know I'm swiftly running out of time. It's amazing how time runs away with these things. As you can see, we, we've got, we're doing pretty well here. We've got um, good, pretty good coverage, certainly of South and East London. People have done a great job, particularly south of the river. There are some areas in North London which still need to do There's, There is plenty of work here still to do. So if, if you're interested in having a go, um, you just, all you need to do is sign up with an account. Bob's your uncle, you can get started. And we actually think it's a quite good fun. Um, people we've talked to have found it therapeutic. Obviously, you're, you're, if, if you're interested in London, it's great. You can really d do a deep dive into the booth maps. Just a few things to say about what we're planning to do next. Um, so we want to complete this crowdsourced digital uh, classification of the booth map. We we'll need, I think, to do quite a lot of QA, quality assurance of the data we've gathered. We we'll need to think how we package up the data set so that we can use it on both on Charles Booth London, perhaps also on Layers of London, the Layers of London website. And we'd like to release that data set openly for other people to use. So if people are interested in, um, in uh, reconstructing a booth, uh, a booth map themselves using, those, um, uh, using those, that data set, they're free to do so. And we also want to um, make available more of Booth's notebooks. We've got the police notebooks on Charles Booth's London. We want to uh, make the rest of that archive available, particularly um, at the moment, while people aren't able to visit LSE in person, we think it would be great if the rest of those notebooks were made available. So thanks. The last thing I'm going to do is share some URLs with you, and I'll do that using the Zoom chat functionality. And I can see people have got some questions, which is great. Um, there are those URLs. So the first is Charles Booth's London. The second is the Layers of London Poverty Classification Tool. The third one is a, an article which I wrote, which is a bit more of a deep dive into some of the aspects of the um, crowdsourcing application. And it links through to a lot 
to a lot of other resources as well. Um, so that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. I had a slide as well, so let me um, just share that quickly. Which is to say thank you. It gives mine and Indy's email addresses. Um, thank you. I think, uh, Liam, that's back over to you. It is. Uh, great. Thanks very much, guys. It was, that was really interesting. Uh, and really interesting to see what you're doing next. And also, I think, uh, to see that the boot maps have continued relevance today and we can see a lot of the um, echoes of what he did uh, still present in London today, if that makes any sense. Uh, so yeah, I'll just open it up to questions now from the audience. If you want to uh, type it in the chat box, uh, I'll relay them. Um, I think we already have a few, so we can get started with those. Uh, just one question that I came to my mind um, while you were speaking. It's like, do you know who did the actual coloring in of the maps? And that, because I thought that must have been a big job. <laughs> Yeah, that's a yeah, it's a good question actually. I'm not one not one that I've been asked before. Um not off the top of my head, I have to be honest. We have, as I said, the working maps in um the archives, which are great big ordnance survey, very detailed um sheets, um, where you can see kind of individual houses and gardens and all the a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. Um and that's what they use to paint over. The, the published maps were Stanford maps again, so ex already existing maps that they that they were then coloured over and then printed and published within the books. But in terms of who did the actual uh, colouring of the working maps, I don't know. That's a good question. I like to think it was Booth with a pot of paint <laughs> and a few others, but yeah, I'm not sure. They must have had a, a team of draftsmen, um, yeah. I suppose, working on on on. Uh, on those on those maps yeah we've actually had those the hand colored maps digitized fairly recently as well so that's another potential thing we could add add to the website in due course uh, okay so i'll just check what questions we have um so on that black heat square that you showed neil uh some of the buildings were in gray and not colored in um what, why so those those tend to be municipal buildings of one kind or another or um things like factories so um i won't i won't skip back into the application now because we're, we're i think we're running a little bit short time but it'll be things like schools uh churches um uh government buildings of one kind or another um industrial buildings so it's it's essentially buildings where there's no one dwelling, uh, of, of which there is a, a big range. I think that's right, isn't it, Indy? Yeah, no, absolutely. I uh, agree with that. They they were, as I said, Stanford maps. So they were published by uh, Stanford's map shop. So I think they were general um, maps of London, Atlas maps of London, showing yeah, churches and various municipal buildings. And so that's what they used to then colour over, essentially. So they weren't original maps for Boots per created for the inquiries are actually using existing maps. Uh, a question from Gil: um, Did Mrs. Booth get involved in the research? I believe she she did to the extent where she was involved with the publication of them. We've got lots of letters um, from uh, and to Mary, uh, where she's very involved in the actual publication. So the kind of checking of drafts and making sure that. Um, the material um, that goes into the publications was correct and suitable. So she was very involved there. I, I imagine she would have been um, involved with checking the um, research. I don't know whether she actually did much in the way of research herself. Um, I haven't seen material indicating that, but I could be wrong. And a question from Hannah. Uh, how did they delineate which houses belonged in which colour category? E.g. now we have a relative poverty threshold, but assuming there wasn't a strict measure back then. For instance, I've noticed there are streets split in half by colours. Yeah, uh, and certain streets are kind of, um, you'll see it on the Laser London website, some streets are kind of one colour and then on the outside they might be coloured black or kind of 
um, you know, dark blue bordered with black. And so that kind of indicates usually that it isn't an exact science. Um, Booth, in one of the kind of notebook entries that, that I included in my in slides, you can see that individual households were given uh, letters denoting, generally speaking, what the classification would be, but they didn't do it at an individual household level. Instead, what they did was summons. So if, if a street was mostly bees, then it would tend to be dark blue. But if there was mostly B, if there was you know, 60, 70 percent bees and a significant minority were black or light blue, then that would be the bordering or that bordering would also be included on there. So it wasn't an exact science. Um, this, this caused a great deal of complexity when we were trying to work out the crowdsourcing application, as you might imagine. The, the thing with these maps is that the closer you look at them, the more, the more complex they become. It's like a fractal piece of fractal geometry on a Mandelbrot set or something like that. Um, but we, we did the best we could. Uh, a question we get asked a lot is that why do some of the, some of the buildings have a very narrow strip of a different colour um, at the front, say? Do we know? I sometimes say it might have been due to shop shops on the ground level or something. Uh, so would, it, would that be where it's... Where where most the of the building is, say, light red, but then there's a very narrow strip of dark red at the front. Okay, yeah, so... Yeah, I guess, um, I can't think of any at the top of my head. I imagine that might be the bordering again, where there's kind of mixed, sometimes uh, there were kind of mixed categories within. Mm -hmm. And a question from Adam. We hear a lot about unconscious bias in profiling now. Do we see evidence of racial or religious profiling skewing the decisions they made when classifying? Um, it's. Def you definitely notice it when you look at the descriptions in, well, particularly in George Duckworth's police notebooks, um, where they're going around different parts of London and the classification is given to streets where there's a majority Irish population or Jewish populations or kind of other, there's definitely a kind of racial um, a sense of racial kind of hierarchy and, and prejudice within those descriptions, um, for sure. Uh, that's very clear in, in, in certain descriptions there. And it comes through very clearly in the, as I said, in the police notebooks. Um, but yeah, it, it's, I would say have a look at the uh, highlights page for kind of race and ethnicity, which I think is on the website. We explore some of that in more detail. There's actually, I've stopped sharing my screen now so that I can Google this article. There was a review of um, uh, Charles Booth's poverty maps um, in the London Review of Books, um, the latest issue of the LRB, and I've just shared the URL for that, which I hope is that article's openly available. And the author, Alison Light, um, talks about these issues around race and religion and how that was a, a blind spot for Booth and his team um, in interesting fashion. So I'd encourage you, um, if you're interested in that particular topic, to have a read of that article. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we'll leave it there. We've gone a little bit over. So uh, sorry if we didn't get to your question, but I think uh, that was uh, very interesting. And thanks for uh, presenting. Uh, I think lots to think about. No problem. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for hosting. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thanks all. Cheers. And yeah, thanks for everyone for attending and we'll be holding more webinars over the next few weeks on Thursday at the same time. Uh, so keep an eye on our website and our social media uh, for updates on that. All right, and we have lots of thank yous coming through in the chat, so.